All right, so Matt, last night, Ashley and I had a date, and it was great. Tomorrow, we're going to try a grape. (laughs) (laughs) Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody. Here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I am doing great. Excellent. Excellent. So before we get into it here, I'll say go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find a list of shows that we're happy to be associated with, and you can find some tips and tricks on podcasting. And we also want to thank tonight's sponsors, Care Of and HelloFresh, and we'll get more into them throughout the episode. While you're on the internet doing your internet thing, if you haven't given us a review, go over and give us a review. We haven't said that in a while, but, you know, it helps us out. This is a new year, and the, the reviews, they don't just boost Matt and my ego. They actually help bring people into the graveyard. Yeah, and and they do boost our ego a little. That's bit. true. That's true. But the main reason is for the the way the algorithm works is the more reviews we get, um, the higher up we we go when uh, somebody goes in and says, well, "I'm looking for a new podcast about haunted places or paranormal stuff or uh, by cryptids. two idiots from the south." Yeah, <laughs> there's a better chance that Graveyard Tales is going to pop up mm-hmm. in the uh, you know when when they do that, and and that's what we want because it just brings more people into the graveyard. Exactly. So Matt, what are we doing tonight, brother? Ah, uh, tonight is episode two of our uh, celebration of the Victorian tradition of sharing ghost stories yep. around the fire on Christmas Eve. Um, so if you if you haven't uh, listened to episode one, jump back, grab that one. You're going to hear a bunch of really great stories. Uh, a lot of stuff out of Pennsylvania last week for uh, the last show for some reason. Oddly I don't enough, know why? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of connections. Um, but we're 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 gonna we're gonna finish out the rest of the stories uh, for the, for uh, this episode. Uh, so if you didn't hear yours the first go around, you'll hear it tonight. Uh, All right. Unless you send it in <laughs> after our cutoff date. Right. Um, I wanted right. to make make that clear on this episode because I we didn't mention it last episode, but we had a cutoff date of December 1st that we had mentioned. If you send it in after, I know we've gotten a few that were after the deadline. Don't worry. I've tucked it away in our email vault there in a folder for 2024's listener stories. So the next time we do a listener stories episode, yours will be in there. You can send them in anytime you want with the subject listener stories 2024. But just so you know, if you send it in after December 1st, uh, it's not going to be on this episode because we had already compiled all the stories and started recording and all that stuff. So, we didn't forget about you. We just had to delay you. <laughs> That's right. Well, hang on to it. So you don't you don't have to rewrite it and send it. We got it. Right. Okay. All right. So the first story that we're going to get into tonight is from BB. Now, BB says, this event has stuck with me since it happened when I was a child. I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and we had a two-story home in Topeka, Kansas. I was in my parents' bedroom and remembered watching a movie with dinosaurs, one of those ultra-cheesy movies like One Million Years B.C., a a real Ray Harryhausen classic. It's the early 80s, and my loves were Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, and Buck Rogers. Legos were space-themed, and yes, In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. So I can say my mind was packed with the unknown intermingled with curiosity and a little fear. 
That night, something drew me to my parents' window. It was dark outside and floating just above eye level, standing on the second floor of the house that sits on a hill, was a diamond-shaped, multicolored object. I don't remember a sound. I don't remember any sound, for that matter, not even from the TV in the same room. I watched it float by, and it paused like we were eye to eye. I was terrified and ran downstairs to my parents. I finally convinced my dad to come upstairs and look at it. Of course, it was gone by the time he made it up there. The object was diamond-shaped, not like jewelry, but like a diamond on a deck of cards. 3D and multicolored. It moved slowly from where I was standing. It looked like I looked like it was floating in the middle of the street just above our house. It slowly rotated, but the colors changed on each panel. Pastel colors of red, blue, green, white, soft, and bright. It's like I'm standing there now in my in my pajamas, LOL. So he's recounting the the memory there. Mm -hmm. Later that night, I went to bed. I saw it again. I know I saw it high in the sky. My father said it was just an airplane, but the spin and the speed, I just knew inside it was the same object. It took me a long time to sleep soundly. I, to this day, look to the sky wondering what I saw and if I would ever see it again. A little panic rises within me and it takes time for me to let it go. Now, UFO, UAP, spirit, portal, I don't know. My parents remember when I came down yelling for them to see it, so they believe me or at least entertain me and my memory. I have a grandmother who lived in Kansas and said she saw a bright light and disc-shaped object rise from the crops. I think uh, that is where the patience comes from. Anyway, I think about it from time to time. I have looked on the MUFON map and others, and there are some reports of diamond-shaped objects, but different years. But I still wonder. Yeah, I I think you had a UAP sighting there, my friend. Uh-huh. It sure does sound like it. And that that is crazy. Of the paranormal stuff I've experienced and all that, I really want to see a UFO with my yeah. own eyes. Yeah, yeah. But as we know, it, it's becoming more and more in the media here lately. So, you know, I, I think sightings are going up because people are actually looking up. But mm -hmm. I want to know what drew you to that window in the first place. What made you say, I need to go over there and look out the window? Yeah, I know that it's another it's another thing. It's what makes you look up, you know, what what gives you that? feeling of oh what is that mm -hmm. you know because um you know amanda my dad saw one yeah. a few years ago um really i mean really strange i don't know what i must have been i'm a, i think when it happened it happened so fast and the two of them saw it and by the time they said something to me about it i it was already gone um but but yeah i mean they both were looking and then they she said they looked right right at one another yeah it was like what the Did you heck? see that? You <laughs> saw that too, right? <laughs> yep. All right. All right. So my next one comes from SS. It starts with, my name is SS in Rochester, New York, and I investigate the paranormal. I have trouble sleeping, and it was about 2 a.m. I had the radio on and in bed with my back to the radio. Then all of a sudden, I heard a whisper, hey coming from behind me. I didn't give it a second thought because I thought it was the radio. A few seconds pass and I heard a much harsher whisper. Hey, let's just say my goosebumps had goosebumps. Yep. Fast forward a few months and a friend wanted to do a ghost hunt of my house. Ghost hunting 101 says you never investigate your own house. Mm -hmm. Well, we did. And we had amazing evidence. At one point, we investigated the master bedroom. I set up a paranormal music box and aimed it in the closet. I said to the spirit, this device sends out an infrared beam. If you break the beam, the music box goes off like this. I showed how it worked and then said, we'll ask you questions. If the answer is yes, 
Make the box go off. If the answer is no, just leave it. Do you understand? It went off for yes. Mm. We asked questions and had yes and no responses. My friend asked, is something holding you here? The PMB or the paranormal music box went off for yes. Then I asked, were you the one who said hey to me that one night? Guys, it went off for yes. Hmm. Another time, uh, shortly after this happened, it was the middle of the night and I'm trying to sleep. And from the darkness of my bedroom, I heard a little girl's sad voice say, can you help me? Nope. Oh nope. man, I sw- my beard just grew half an inch <laughs> from the from the chill bumps I got reading that. I'm serious. That oh man, yeah. Hey, this no is thanks. why you don't investigate your own house. Exactly. <laughs> you knew better. You knew better than to do that. <laughs> That's right. Now you you've stirred something up. You're gonna it, now you got a job. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> you got a job when you're home. Uh All right, so this next one I got is from our good buddy, R. McG. And we all know R. McG from years past. Right. Says, because I know how much Adam likes ghost kids, here's a story for you guys. Happy (laughs) holidays, boys. (laughs) Thanks. Of course. (laughs) Thanks, R. It says, Due to client confidentiality, I'm changing some minor facts for the story about times, locations, and some minor descriptive info. The facts of the investigation findings are not changed at all. Several years back, my team received a call from a recently divorced mother of a small child. The client, we will call her Janet, had moved to Central Florida after a divorce. She had purchased a home for her and her minor daughter, who we will call Susie. Janet informed us she had been experiencing paranormal activity in the new home to include her keys disappearing and reappearing, a disembodied voice of a small child that was not her daughter, footsteps in the home, and seeing an apparition of a small female child sitting on the staircase. Janet said after seeing the apparition for herself, she wanted the house investigated. I ran the background on the residence, and it had no history of violence or death in the house. The home was a recent build for the area as it was approximately 50 to 60 years old. The houses in the area were usually much older than this, but I could find nothing on the land parcel other than farming prior to the build. I did the initial interview with Janet. Janet advised the activity was sporadic, but had picked up lately. Janet also told us that her daughter, who like he said, we'll refer to as Susie, had been playing with an imaginary friend named Stacy. Stacy had only come into the picture after moving into the house. I interviewed Susie, and she said Stacy was real. She could see her, and they played with dolls together. Susie stated Stacy would sleep in bed with her, but would run away when Janet came to check on her. Susie said she told her mom that she could hear Stacy running from the room and that she, her mother, should be able to hear her too. Susie said she told Stacy to show herself to Janet, and Stacy did show herself to Janet when she was sitting on the stairs. With the confirmation of the footsteps and apparition, we started the investigation of the house. The first one and a half nights there was no there was no activity that could not be debunked. No electronic voice phenomenon, no electromagnetic field spikes, no hits on any gear left out, and no audible responses to requests for noises to be made. Shortly after 1 a.m. on night two, I asked the child entity to identify itself by name. I was using my digital recorder to capture electronic voice phenomena, and I got an adult male voice that responded with one word, hiding. I asked the entity if the child was hiding, and I got the response, me. We continued with no further interaction from the male entity. That night, at approximately 3.15, my partner saw what she believed to be a small child run from the master bedroom into the child's bathroom. The shower curtain was caught moving, and the temperature in the bathroom lowered significantly. 
We both heard a small female child giggle from the bathroom. No further activity was recorded on that night. Night three and four were extremely active. Multiple incidents of disembodied laughing, footsteps, gear going off, and EVPs captured of a little girl saying, play, help, and Stacy. The entity was identifying itself at the, as the little girl that was the imaginary friend of Susie. We never got any clarification of the help response, but it is not unusual for entities to ask for help. We reported the findings to Janet. I told Janet I was not comfortable with the unknown male entity and the EVP we got from him, but what we found was what we found. I was not completely satisfied with the investigation, but with nothing further, we decided to leave it open and return was always an option. I was very uneasy about the male entity being left unidentified. Two months later, Janet contacted us again, stating the child entity was now not nice and was harassing her and her daughter, scaring them, not letting them sleep, and went as far as scratching her daughter. We scheduled to return in a week. In speaking to Susie again, she confirmed what her mother had advised us. We were even provided with a photo of what appeared to be a four-finger scratch on Susie down the center of her back where she could not reach. Mm. Susie said Stacy was, quote, being mean and scaring her while she was sleeping. Susie and Stacy were shaking. Susie said Stacy was shaking her awake when she was, quote, red on her hair and face. We determined this to be Stacy appearing to be bloody about the face and hair. The follow-up investigation was very quiet. No activity for three nights. I again got an adult male EVP stating it was hiding. Upon doing more research, I found a male who had committed suicide on the same street approximately 40 years prior. The male was in love with the former resident of the farm, and his love was unrequited. He committed suicide on the farm with a shotgun on Christmas Day after his present was denied, as well as his advances to be the farmer's daughter's paramour. The male had shot himself in the face in the open field of the farm. I believe this is why the child entity was appearing to be bloody about the face. We went back to the location and brought out an experienced medium to investigate with us. The investigation revealed the following. The adult male entity had been revealing himself to Susie as a child to gain her trust, to gain energy. He then began to feed off the fear he was creating to become stronger. As he became stronger, he continued to threaten and frighten the females in the house in an act of vengeance for his unrequited love. The male entity was removed from the property through mediumship and house cleansing. We received no further reports of activity from the family. That's crazy. I know, but that's exactly what I thought. Mm-hmm. Was this whatever this male entity is is posing as a child? Yep. Um, I had the feeling you know, the kid was not a kid. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh man, yeah, that's creepy as all get out. R. G. always has some crazy stories from his <laughs> he investigations. Sure does, man. He sure does. All right, uh, this next one comes from TV. Hey, you got cool initials, TV. Mm-hmm. Um. I heard it on TV. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> TV told me. This is a little background first. My wife and I have been together going on 10 years now. Her uncle had passed away in 2012, and I had never had the pleasure of meeting this great man. But I'd heard enough stories about him to have an idea of how much we could have probably clicked and just gotten along. Fast forward to the year 2014. My wife is pregnant with our daughter. My wife was a high-risk pregnancy due to preeclampsia, so the doctors were keeping a little closer eye on her during appointments, and many times I feel as if they were more frequent than normal pregnancies. Our daughter was due in late July, early August. My wife's blood pressure was continuously getting higher, so she was admitted to the hospital. The doctor told the resident whom was helping out, keep an eye on her blood pressure and let me know if anything changes. Well, I guess he took that too literally. Her blood pressure had never gone down. We were informed of an emergency C-section. 
As I mentioned, she wasn't due until late July, early August. So here we are in late June, the day of the C-section. I was gowned up. The doctors and team were telling us how everything was going to happen. Being first-time parents, we were both beyond nervous as they took my wife to the room. We had to be buzzed in by a nurse's station. Otherwise, the doors were automatically locked at all times. After everything was set up, the team began the C-section. Everything was going well until one of the nurses had asked me to please step out of the room for a moment. At this point, I'm about to have a panic attack. No other information was given to me aside from please step out for a minute into the hallway. Without hesitation, I immediately asked, Uncle Frank, if you're here with me, give me a sign, please. Let me know everything's okay in there. Within a second, those doors that were always locked had opened. No one had visibly come through. The nurse at the station did not look up to see if it was an accident. I felt something go running by me with enough speed to feel a breeze pass by. Moments later, the nurse comes out of the room. Come in, Dad, and meet your baby girl. I knew all too well he had answered me, and it was her uncle who came to me. This was the same hospital that he had unfortunately passed away in a few years before. Now skip ahead a few years. Our daughter is with my wife waiting for a red light to change. She looks up at an older model vehicle, looks up, tells my wife, that's Uncle Frank's car. Wow. My wife told me the make, model, and color had all been the same looking vehicle that her uncle owned at one point. I know I can't necessarily say it was for sure her uncle that had come to us in the hospital or not, but I sure like to think that it was and that he continues to watch over us to this day. Man, mm-hmm. that, that is a cool story, but how, how would this little girl go, that's Uncle Frank's car? Right. When her right. her father had not even met Uncle Frank. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That is crazy. And I, I guarantee you the make, model, and year of the car was not something they told her about her Uncle Frank. Certainly not. You know, Certainly they, they I'm sure she knew about Uncle Frank. Yeah. But I I they didn't sit down and go, okay, so he had a a 1984 Lincoln Continental. And then this girl remembering that and knowing what it is and pick there, there are too many coincidences for that to be something that she heard and remembered. Right. Even if she had seen a picture, maybe yeah. uncle Frank's car was in the picture. Um, that would be tough. For a child to rem- hell, it'd be tough for me to remember. I, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, you know, and I see a I see a photograph of a car, and I mean, I'd have to see that photograph every day. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and to to go oh, or have known Uncle Frank, right? Which she didn't either. Right. Well, I don't know. She may have seen a picture every day, but nonetheless, um, I think that would have been a part of it. You know, it, I think the the magic of this story is that. This kid shouldn't have known that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. I like that. All right. So, my next one is from TL. I went to Savannah with a friend of mine earlier this year, and as we wandered around the town, we stumbled across this shop called New Olfactory. They had a sign on the door about having paranormal investigators there, but I thought nothing of it as we went inside. The store had really cool soaps, candles, teas, tarot cards, spooky signs, just witchy, gothy vibes throughout. So my kind of place. The shop was two separate sections connected by a short hallway. And as we wandered around the shop, we headed to the other section through the hallway. As soon as I crossed the other side, I felt like my stomach went hollow. I felt this strange feeling in my collarbones and my knees and thighs felt like I was wading through a pool. I felt so uneasy. I left that side pretty quickly and went back to the primary side of the shop. I joked to the proprietor, man, feels strange over there. He said, that's odd. Usually people say that about this side. 
That side used to have a cemetery under it, uh, one of the oldest in Savannah. Says, I was shocked. Then it happened again. I went to Charleston a few weeks later with the same friend, and we toured the USS Laffey, where I had a similar triggering moment in the combat system space. I'm a Navy veteran, so I just assumed it was Navy PTSD, like triggering from being on a ship and on the water again for the first time in almost a decade. We left the ship and headed downtown to get lunch and explore. We went into the oldest tavern in Charleston called the Tavern at Rainbow Row. They had a beer they had beer samples, so why not? When you walk in, this shop is divided into sections as well. The main one, then one to the left with the stairs to the upper floor, one behind that one acting as a wine cellar, and one behind the main area with the bathrooms. We went in and walked left into the section with the stairs, and again, as soon as I crossed the threshold, my knees went weak, my stomach felt hollow, and my collarbones felt funny. I also got a bit dizzy, but we didn't, but we hadn't even had our beers yet. So I asked the proprietor what the history of the place was, and jokingly asked if they had any ghosts. It is Charleston, after all, they say. He said, actually, this is really cool, and showed us to the wine cellar and asked if we noticed anything odd. Immediately, I noticed the trap door in the floor and pointed it out. The man said, yes, most people don't notice it right away, but we went down there, and apparently it was used for bootlegging. But before that, it was used to store deceased victims of yellow fever. Again, I was shocked. I had the same exact feeling in two separate places where the dead had been placed and then removed. I can't explain it. Then, a few months later, my boss and I traveled for an archaeology project to the Outer Banks. We stayed at the Silver Lake Inn in Ocracoke Island. When I got into my room, which was very dated, gave me 70s vibes with the cedar walls, floors, and bathroom, but I loved it, I immediately felt like I was on the deck of a boat. Now. We had taken the ferry over from the mainland, so I didn't think much of it. I did, however, text my boyfriend about the strange feeling. The next morning, my boss and I were checking out and mentioned to the owner that we were archaeologists. She said the hotel had an interesting history and said, quote, we have a poltergeist here, too. Want to meet him? <laughs> Want to meet him? Yeah, right. My boss and I exchanged looks. I, I looked at her and said, you're joking, right? You're messing with us. She said, no. He knocks things off the table and walls all the time and whispers in my ear when I'm in the office right here, which used to be his office. Right, girls? She nodded at her two teenage staff members, and when I looked at them, there was no hint of amusement on their faces. I looked back at the owner and said, sure, I guess we'll meet your poltergeist. So she leads my boss and I into the office, a converted guest room, she she leads, followed by me and then my boss. As soon as we entered the room, I was shaking hard from head to toe, and I felt that same hollow feeling in my stomach. I looked at my boss, my hands shaking like I'm being electrocuted, and asked if she saw how badly I was shaking. She said she did, and the owner said, you can feel him, can't you? She was shocked at my very physical reaction. And I remember that I had felt off in my bedroom almost directly over this room. Then the owner tells us the former owner was a ghost and had been accused of setting up his wife's murder and been run off the island. Later, we Googled it and found out it was true. In September of last year, I was on a work project in the Great Smoky Mountains, and my crew and I were working on setting up equipment. I came around the truck, and a man in gray was walking up the trail by the maintenance facility. I saw him, turned to put my work gloves in the back of the truck, and when I looked back, two seconds later, the man was gone. I asked the other three people on my crew if they saw him, and they all said no. My crew chief went with me to try and see if we could see him around the corner or down by the stream, and he was nowhere to be seen. I have no idea what happened or how this man just seemed to have vanished, but I was pretty shook by it. These were very spooky occurrences. These very spooky occurrences have all happened to me in the last year alone. I would love a chance to test this because as I get older, 
it seems I get more sensitive to this. That's why. Yeah, that is wild. Oh, man. It sounds like you might be a sensitive in some way. Uh huh. Absolutely. You can you can just feel it. May not be able to see it, but you can definitely feel it. All right. This next one comes from AM. And AM says the earliest spooky memories I have are from when I was about four or five in what I would call my childhood home. The whole house was just off. Apparently, the guy who owned the house prior to my parents just up and disappeared. My parents always said that he probably just took off somewhere, but it was the 90s. I feel like he could have been tracked down if that were the case. The upstairs were probably the worst. It was basically a big circle with rooms and doors. You walk upstairs and there's a hallway along the stairs to your right. On the left was my brother's room and at the end of the hallway was mine. In between our rooms was the creepiest freaking playroom you can imagine, as well as a Jack and Jill bathroom. Basically, my room was connected to the bathroom that was then connected to the playroom that was then connected to my brother's room, and then you had his door to lead back out in the hallway. Sounds fun for two kids, except it wasn't. We hated that playroom. And that is saying something from two kids with an entire room full of their toys. Mm -hmm. It was just cold and creepy, dark, and felt heavy. The doors would continuously close and open with no wind and no one near them. We'd hear noises. We'd hear noises and see shadows, and it just felt like a black pit of melancholy. We never played in that room, only grabbed what we wanted out of it and left. It just felt like someone was watching you and almost like something bad was going to happen. My brother has said on more than one occasion, he would just watch the door to the playroom close itself at night. Luckily, we weren't there for too long. Flash forward a couple of years. We had just moved into our stepdad's parents' house to wait until our new house was finished being moved into the field next door. Their house was an old farmhouse that had been built in the early 1800s and once again just felt cold and off. We knew about at least one death that had taken place there, but given its age and where it was located outside of town, we can imagine that there were more. We immediately got used to the ghosties and just shared our space with them. Pretty much every night, We'd hear footsteps going up and down the stairs to the second floor. Even when you were in the hallway and could see no one, those footsteps would sound. Shadows and noises, whispers were also norm and also the norm. We just got used to it. And, and that's what you do. You just mm-hmm. get used to it. My room was the worst. It was straight across the top of the stairs. The hallway was open and you could look down into the staircase from pretty much every angle. My room was always cold and had an open register that you could look into and see the foyer below. And of course, you could see my room from below. My room was just always creepy and I could always hear things from below during the night when no one was around. The worst incident occurred one night when my cousin, who was about two at the time, was standing in the foyer under the register and just talking away. I went to go get her and looked up to see who she was talking to, and I kid you not, there was a dark face looking down right at me. Jeez. Yeah. I can still see it, and it gives me chills. The rest of us checked, but there was no one upstairs at the time. Well, no one alive anyway. The next year, we were out of that house and into the new house next door. I say new in quotations because we had bought this house from a church and moved it onto our road. It was an old parsonage, and the spooky energy definitely came with it. Man, this kid just can't escape. Right. (laughs) 
Although the only thing that any of us ever claim to to see is just a quick black shadow the size of a cat every now and then. My mom, stepdad, and younger brother still live there, and I have not heard of any stories in quite some time. There were only five houses on our little, little dirt road, and the farmhouse wasn't the oldest, nor apparently the most haunted. The last house on the road was. The story goes that a young couple built the house after they were married in the early 1800s, and shortly after, the young woman died of an illness, so her grieving husband hung himself from one of the trees out front. That house is now gone and another one was built in its place. I've only ever been inside a handful of times, but that house gives me the creeps too. Could just be that road though. If you took a picture of it and put it in the dictionary under definitely haunted dirt road, no one would question it. (laughs) It says most recently my house, um, my boyfriend and I bought our house in 2019 and immediately the spook started. It was built in 1918, so it's seen some things. One of the first nights we were living there, my boyfriend was there alone and was moving some things. He was in the kitchen and had our basement door open. Now, when you when you do this, it closes the entry from the kitchen to the living room. As he was walking towards the door to leave, he heard a very distinct whistling at him. We had just moved in, so there was no TV, um, no music, you know, nor were any windows open as it was November in New York. And this was not the only time he heard it. A couple of months later, I was home alone and upstairs by myself. I had been watching a movie I've seen a hundred times and could hear it playing downstairs. If you know old houses, you know sound travels everywhere. Then. I heard what I thought was my boyfriend coming in the door and talking to a female. Thinking it was one of his friends that had stopped over, I ran downstairs to greet them. When I got there, I was still alone. Jeez. He had not come home yet, and no one else was there. It was still winter, so no windows were open to hear anyone outside either. Once again... This would not be the only time we've heard talking when no one was when when no one was home. Last year, maybe about August or September, I was home alone getting ready for work in the kitchen when I heard a hello kind of quiet. Now our windows in our kitchen are sealed shut with paint. And even if our windows in our living room were open, it was 6 30 a.m. No one was out and about greeting anyone on our quiet little street. Where did the hello come from? We hear creaks in the floorboards, noises noises in other rooms, and I've seen shadows move in ways we could not have possibly moved. And we've gotten used to them. I'm not sure if I'm the paranormal magnet or if I'm just unlucky enough to keep moving to haunted homes, but I've made my peace with that. As long as they are not harming me, I will live in peace with them. And I still enjoy scary movies, podcasts, ghost tours, and the like. I chose to embrace the scares and spooks and relish in the fact that I have somewhat definitive proof that we're not alone. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And look, I I don't know that it's that you're a magnet. I I think this is more that you you're in tune to mm-hmm. the what what kind of paranormal activity a house may have yep. um you know out of out of everywhere i've lived um three of the houses definitely have stuff going on my my parents house um my house in hendersonville and the house i'm in currently i i you know multiple stories from every place I, 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 you know, I, I am not one, you know, I mean, except with the exception of maybe 30 years ago when I was in high school, you know, messing with a Ouija board and learning my lesson, Mm. um, you know, I, I don't really do anything that would facilitate, you know, a, a haunting, 
You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not conjuring anything. You know, I don't, I don't, we don't do any kind of, you know, spells or witchcraft, nothing. Okay. We don't do anything that would bring it to me. I think it's just there. Right. And, you know, I either my presence maybe, you know, kicks it up a notch or which I have been told of, you know, for a very long time since, since I was probably about 17. Uh, I, I've been told that, you know, I, I have this ability that I've never, ever, ever, uh, you know, tried to pursue. Um, but you know, I just, it causes me to see and hear a lot of different things. So I think for you, you may be in the same situation. You have that innate quality that allows you to be in tune with, you know, the spiritual realm and, you experience a lot of stuff, not necessarily scary. Um, you just kind of get used to it when you realize it's not going to hurt you. Um, yeah, I think it's around us more than most of us know. Mm -hmm. And only some of us are able to pick up on it. Like if we were all more sensitive to it, we'd pick up on it everywhere. Yeah. But I, I think because most of us are not tuned that way, we don't notice it and only certain people have that ability to, Oh yeah, it's here. Mm -hmm. And, and I do think a, a lot of it is very subtle. Um, it becomes less subtle when you become aware of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's subtle nonetheless for someone that maybe you're, you're not, you're not thinking about it or you're just, there's so much going on around you that you don't pick up on it. Um, it's like, it's like this house. Um, you know, I've said this before on the show. Um, you know, I, I haven't smoked in eight years, nine years now. Um, and even, you know, in, in those times we didn't really smoke in the house, mm -hmm. but it's been, it's been long enough for um us to not routinely smell cigarette smoke in the house right and we smell it mm -hmm. you know random different spots there are certain spots where you'll you'll pick up on it um if it's there um but it really overall it's been anywhere um we we don't live right up against our neighbors you know we you know there you're not going to you're not going to accidentally catch you know, a neighbor smoking in their yard and it waft into your house. Plus neither one of our neighbors smoke. So it's weird, you know, like I said, subtle, but yet you become aware of it and then you pick up on it when it happens. And I think this may be what's happening in this story. Yep. Yep. I think it's just always there and they're noticing it. Yeah. Adam, let's take a moment and talk about one of our long-term sponsors, Kerov. Now, you've probably heard us talk about Kerov before, um, but if you haven't, Kerov is a subscription supplement service that sends nutritional supplements right to your door, and it actually helps you learn what supplements you should be taking to meet your health goals. Right. Yeah, you take a, a very simple quiz uh, that asks you some questions about what you're looking for, and it lays out a plan of supplements uh, for you to take. Uh, it's super convenient and way better than standing in those long vitamin aisles at the store trying to figure out what in the world should I be taking? No, it really is. And, you know, like Matt mentioned, the quiz, it's... A pretty short quiz. You go on there and you talk about your health goals and what you're wanting to accomplish. And with this being the start of the new year, now is the time to do it. If you're if you got a New Year's resolution and you want to get some vitamins, some supplements to help out with that, care of is the way to do it. You go on there and talk about what you're wanting to accomplish, and they will suggest a vitamin supplement routine for you. And for me. I'm always looking for brain health 
and focus stuff and stuff to help with stress and tension. And so they they suggested astaxanthin for brain health and rhodiola for focus. Mm-hmm. And then ashwagandha for the stress and tension relief. Yep. And me being a uh, herbal nerd, I knew <laughs> right away when they suggested those that care of knows what they're doing, knows what they're talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the cool thing is that you get the vitamins in these little individual daily packs. So if you're going on a trip like Ashley and I are soon, you just throw these packs in your toiletries bag or your suitcase or whatever and go. You do not have to worry about carrying hundreds of bottles with you like I used to do. Or or like I did, I would separate them out into the Ziploc bags. Uh, yep. yep. By each day. Yep. What a what a pain. I tried that too. You don't have it, to do that with Carol. Yeah, it didn't work. And uh, the, their individual daily packs are great for that. I mean, just for regular daily use, going to the gym or going to work. And their vitamin packs are made with plant-based compostable film. So it helps you limit the impact on the environment without compromising on the quality and safety of their products. So if you want to get on the care of train like Matt and I, and like a bunch of our listeners, because I have been messaged and seen posted about people getting on the care of train with us to start this new year. All you've got to do to get 50% off your first care of order is go to takecareof.com and enter our promo code GRAVE50. That's G R A V E 50. Yeah, for 50% off your first care of order, just go to takecareof.com. Dot com and enter our promo code GRAVE50. That's G R A V E 50. All right. So the next one I've got is from RH. And it says This story was told to my two cousins and I when we were around 14 by our grandfather. Now, I just want to say that my grandfather was a member of the greatest generation and was a Marine in the Pacific Theater in World War II. Well, thank you, sir, for everything you did. And he was probably a pretty serious dude. Oh, yep. Most likely. Everybody I've met, they they had their jovial side, but they didn't kid around too much about Mm -hmm. certain things. Yeah. Anyway, it says uh, he was a thoughtful, quiet, and serious man. (laughs) See? See, I'm not not even looking at it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) not given to tall tales or boasting of any kind. So when he walked in and saw us boys watching a Bigfoot documentary one snowy afternoon around Christmas, we were surprised that he sat and watched it with us. After the show ended, he asked us if we wanted to hear a story from when he was a boy. We all readily agreed, and this is the tale that he told. It says, when I was about 13 years old, which would have put the year at 1938, says, I was a member of a Boy Scout troop. Now, I lived in a small town up near Allagash Forest, northwestern Maine, at the time, and it was midsummer. Now, we were on a big camping trip fairly deep into the forest at the time, and on this particular day, we had gone on a long hike through the woods. It was mid-afternoon, and we were on our way back to our campsite. All of a sudden, I got a little twisty feeling in my guts and knew I had better go take care of some business. So I told my troop leader and everyone stopped for a water break while I headed off into the woods a ways, grabbing some big maple leaves along the way. A few hundred feet into the woods, I came upon a small little clearing, and though I was still in earshot of my troop, I had long since lost sight of them. I figured this would be as, as good a spot as any, so I proceeded to drop my drawers and handle the situation. Now, I proceeded with what needed to be done, and I began to hear heavy crunching sounds from the forest around me, and my first thought was I had wandered near a bear. I began to hurry the process as much as I could when the noises stopped. I finished my business, but before I could pull up my britches, I heard a long snuffling sound from my left. I stood up quickly and looked in that direction, and I saw a thick patch of dark brown fur. Then I followed that up and up, to a face looking back at me. This thing had to be eight or nine feet tall. Two black eyes peered back at me from under a large, heavy brow ridge in an ape-like face. 
This creature took a big sniff and curled its lip and scrunched its nose at me. It was then that I realized I was standing there 15 feet away from this thing with my pants around my ankles and nothing but a maple leaf covered in crap. I, I, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> says, I tell you what, boys, if I hadn't just emptied myself out, I would have done so again right about then. So as quick as I could, I dropped my leaf, bent and pulled up my pants, and when I came back up, the creature was gone. I hadn't heard it move at all. Not looking a gift horse in the mouth, I hightailed it back to my troop. When I got there, I was out of breath, and when they asked me what happened, I didn't want to seem crazy, so I just told them I had seen a bear. It wasn't until many years later that I heard of this Bigfoot thing, but I know now that's what I saw that day. Now, all three of us, it says, were bubbling over with questions, but my grandfather simply said, you heard my story, boys, and I'll swear on everything holy that it's true. Make of that what you will. And he walked away and never spoke of it to us again. That's crazy. Yes. Can you, can you only imagine, Matt, you're out in the woods taking your constitutional, you know, mm-hmm. first of all, I've done that many a time and that is not a comfortable thing to do. Yeah. No, it's not. I, I can't, people will say. You know, I love doing da 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 in the woods. Yeah, I love taking a pee in the woods. I don't like dropping trowel in the woods. It's not comfortable. No. And can you imagine you're in that uncomfortable situation, a Bigfoot comes up and then goes <laughs> at you for taking a dump in his woods. <laughs> what if he'd have pulled up and joined you? Oh, yeah, dude. He he sits down beside you and he goes, <laughs> Yeah. You found yeah. my spot. This is my toilet. <laughs> Hand you a hand you a newspaper, you know, <laughs> Bigfoot Weekly. Yeah, you know, and he- <laughs> newspaper, and he's brought his own roll of toilet paper. He's like, "Why are you using maple leaves, dude?" Yeah, <laughs> man, that is crazy. But you know, I I I tend to I really tend I've said this before. I tend to believe those stories mm-hmm. that that come from these you know older People like formal that. military. Yeah. And it and it really it it's it's just a matter of people from that generation, especially people that served uh, in the armed forces. They have a tendency to not you know over embellish mm-hmm. or or just you know flat out tell a tall tale yep. just for the sake of doing it. My grandfather was that way. Yeah, I mean you know. My my grandfather, um, you know, he served in Korea. Mm-hmm. Um, Mine too. He was a, he he was a pretty serious man. Yep. I mean, he had a fun side, and you could always joke with my pop. You always could. But if he told he was telling you something, you could bank on it. Mm-hmm. You know, that was one thing I always knew is pop is never gonna lie to me. Right. Yep. And I think a lot of people know that about their grandparents, especially, you know, when, when we're talking about people from that generation. Yep. You know, now I, I don't know if, if my grandkids are going to be able to say the same about me. They'll be, cause my dad, he does it to Piper all the time. Oh yeah. You know, Piper to this day, you know, she was a little bitty and she'll go pop eats dirt. You know, <laughs> because he told her that when she was a kid. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, and, but that's just different generation. Yeah. But, my, you know, st- my dad does that to everybody. <laughs> he likes to, and apparently I do it to Ashley too. Cause Ashley said, oh, I see where you get it now. Cause dad will just start telling you something as if it's the most, like he read it this morning. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. he's like, so, I, uh, did you know that this cat, they actually, can twist their foot around backwards, you know, like this whole story and have you believing it. He can do mm-hmm. it with a straight face. And I guess I picked that up because I do it to Michael and Ashley too. So yeah, my grandkids will probably always have to go. Is that serious? Or are you screwing with me? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. My, mine will for sure. So my, our next story uh, comes to us from H. Just H. And H says, in college, 20 years ago, I worked for a security company 
first at a mall and then overnight security at a global power management corporation with offices in Galesburg, Michigan. Anyone who drives I-94 between Detroit and Chicago will know where I'm talking about. Immediately on my first night, I knew there was something off about one area of the building you were required to go through during your tour. In reality, it should have been the least spooky. It was a typical cubicle farm, and the only area with exterior windows we would travel through during the hourly security tour. The first few hours of the four to midnight shift were usually mundane, as the cleaning crew was also in the building and the lights were on. Lights went out when the cleaning was done at seven or eight. Then we'd turn off any cubicle lights left on as we went through as well. Whenever I hit the cube farm, for my instinct told me I was not alone, even when I knew it was only me and the other guard in the building, and I knew they were at the desk. I mentioned to a member of the cleaning crew one night my feelings about that area. She looked at me and said, yeah, it's the kid. Kid? What kid? She then told me she thinks there's a little boy who likes to play tag in that area when the lights are off. If you sense him behind you, turn around quickly and say, gotcha. He'll run. He'll, he'll run away. If you let him get close enough, you'll feel him touch your back. The, huh. the you're it and you're expected to go find him. Huh. Wow. Said, I kind of laughed it off, but having other experiences, but having had other experiences figured she wasn't completely full of it. A few weeks later, during my midnight to eight swing, I sent someone following me as I went along the windows, checking that they were locked. After walking 15 feet or so, I stopped and waited for a moment. There was a faint light reflecting off the windows in my right periphery behind me. I spun on my heel and said, gotcha. The light winked out and a trail of air fluttered the papers pinned to the cube wall, the cubicle walls heading away from me. Wow. Not wishing to find out what it meant to have to find the kid if he tagged me. He said, I'll admit, I ran through that section every tour for the next two <laughs> months before I rotated to another position in the company. Years later, I shared the story on a local Facebook group and someone clued me in. There's been a farm and barn on the property. There, there had been a farm and barn on the property before it was purchased by the corporation. The family lost an eight-year-old son in an accident in the barn. Maybe he still wants to play tag. Oh, wow. Now, see, and, and that's great because you, you can't always get that kind of history on the property. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because it, it doesn't make sense for there to be an eight-year-old or roughly a child spirit in a corporate building. Mm -hmm. You know, especially a modern one. Right. Um, so, you know, even when you think, oh, this house is too new, this building is too new, if you can look into the history, because yep. I guarantee you all of those, those business parks, all of these big, you know, corporate facilities that are on the outskirts of town, they weren't always there. Right. You know, and there was a really good chance that it was farmland or that it was Native American land, something that mm -hmm. that land has some history and see if you can find it. It's not super easy, but if you can find it, you may find some answers. Yep. How many times have you and I said it's a lot of times the land, not mm -hmm. the building? All right. So let's talk about HelloFresh. Now, Matt, you know, the holidays just went past us. And the hardest thing about the holidays is while you're getting ready for your holiday meals and people coming over, you still have to eat dinner. You right. still have to figure out what you're going to eat that is not holiday meal related. And what was the saving grace for us was our HelloFresh box. Oh, man, us too. Yeah, it was it was amazing. You can get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip those trips to the grocery store and you can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Now, whether your New Year's resolution is to save money, eat better, 
or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. You can say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. Because each HelloFresh box is packed with farm-fresh ingredients and everything arrives pre-portioned right to your doorstep for less hassle and less wasted food. And like we've said before, if you need googly moogly berries and you're like, what is that? Where do I get that? You don't have to worry about it. Those googly moogly berries are shipped to you in your HelloFresh box and just the right amount of them. Yeah, and, and it's that time of year where people start looking at, at improving their eating habits. Mm-hmm. So look to HelloFresh's wholesome health forward options like uh, over 30 calorie smart and protein smart recipes each week. And they always say breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and HelloFresh agrees. In fact, they're giving all subscribers free breakfast for life. That's amazing. That, yeah, that means you'll enjoy a totally free breakfast item with every single HelloFresh delivery. Now, that is worth waking up early for. And you said that it saved your holiday mm-hmm. um, dinners. Look, it it, acts, it absolutely saved ours um, because... Madison, Brooks, and Piper all had their turn at fixing a HelloFresh meal. Awesome. So not only did uh, did we get to eat great food together as a family, it freed up Amanda and I to do other stuff because the kids were cooking. Because you get these fantastic recipe cards that are so easy to follow. You get pre-portioned ingredients. You get what you need. And, and it's all laid out. I mean, uh, my youngest is 11, and and she cooked dinner for us. Yeah. It's it's fantastic. And, and if you've got kids that are interested in, in cooking or learning how to cook, or if you yourself are interested in learning how to cook, this is a great way to do it um, and, and get fantastic food. So if uh, if you want to get HelloFresh and save you some time, save you some money, save you some stress, just go to HelloFresh.com slash Graveyard Free and use our promo code Graveyard Free. That's G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D-F-R-E-E for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's right. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Graveyard Free with our code Graveyard Free. G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D-F-R-E-E. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. All right. So the next story comes from DM. It says, when my girls were a lot younger... Their stepmom bought them a Ouija board. We already know this isn't going to turn out well. Anyway, small weird things started to happen. Like a radio clock I had from my dad who was deceased would turn itself, uh, turn on by itself and play music. I remember one particular day I had enough and unplugged it and the darn thing started playing music again after I had left the room. Cups would move. We had a box of old cell phones out in the garage and one of them would ring. It had been dead for a few years. Oh, oh, man. Right? (laughs) That one would freak me out. Mm -hmm. I saw a shadow person come out of my daughter's room and walk into my bedroom. My mind couldn't grasp what was happening. I called out thinking I had glimpsed my husband at the time. He answered from the kitchen. I yelled about someone being in the house. Of course, no one was in the bedrooms. Well, eventually, my youngest daughter started to complain about her room. She was like, please sleep with me. I finally relented because I didn't believe what she was saying, but there I was. Posters lifting off the wall by an unseen wind, whispers of a language I couldn't comprehend coming from her closet. It was utterly terrifying. I was wondering uh, wondering what is causing this. What am I supposed to do? Then I found the board, found out where it came from, and I buried it. I opened my windows when no one was home and saged my house. I had vials of holy water I used in my daughter's room. Did that completely get rid of all the weird happenings? No, but it vastly reduced it. And we moved not long afterward. 
I often wonder if the people who live there now have problems, and I think of that Ouija board buried in the yard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I feel bad for whoever finds that Ouija board, but you did right by getting rid of it. It probably didn't help that it came from the stepmom. <laughs> you know, she's right, probably, yeah. probably thinking, oh, great, thanks. You know, but comes from somebody who's clueless about the paranormal and Ouija boards and all that stuff doesn't realize a harm because it says Hasbro on the box, (laughs) you know, Oh, it's a kid's toy. And that's, and that was one thing that we, we touched on in our Ouija board episode years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but just remember, um, just because it comes in a box and it's made by a toy corporation, it, it's not the device itself. It's what it represents. Yeah. It's a ritual. Yeah. I mean, so when, when you use that, it's like, it, it, you know, people have a seance with a Yankee candle sitting in the middle of it. Right. It, it doesn't or matter. Tarot I mean, cards. Yeah. I mean, you can get branded tarot cards with Mickey Mouse face on it and it's still a tarot card. That's right. You know, I've been, I've been hunting for that Simpsons deck to get for you for years. Oh just, yeah. That'd be fantastic. I can't, I can't get my hands on it. I've seen <laughs> pictures of them. Yeah. But yep. you know, so, but yeah, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. You're right, Adam. It's the, it's the ritual. It's the process of what you're doing and your intent. Mm-hmm. And you know, we talked about curses and spells and all that stuff. And the biggest part of it is the intent. So right. if your intent is to commune with the spirit world, then that's what's going to happen. Even if you you manage to buy the um, the uh, the decorated Stranger Things mm-hmm. Ouija board that Target had when Stranger Things first came out, you know, right. thought, yep. it's got Christmas lights on it. Doesn't yeah. matter. It's your intent that's going to do it. Yep, exactly, exactly right. But glad you got it down a little bit, and glad you moved because yep. that sounded like it was getting crazy with the language that you couldn't understand mm-hmm. when you start hearing that. That's no bueno, man. That's, That's no right. bueno. Wait a minute. When you start hearing a language you don't understand? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's no bueno, amigo. <laughs> no bueno. All right. So our next story comes from J.E., and he writes, or they write, February of this year, 2023, my father passed away. He had a great love of boating and enjoyed watching boats of all sizes moving in and out of Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Boats ranged from smaller motorboats to freighters, and there's a shipbuilder that does winter maintenance on freighters and a world-famous yacht builder that have decades of history in the town. I remember summer trips on Lake Michigan in a sailboat when I lived in Sturgeon Bay as a kid. Well, how cool is that? Yeah, right. Earlier this fall... My wife and I spent a day being tourists in Door County. This is the same county Sturgeon Bay resides in. We visited Death's Door Museum. It had an old fishing trawler I remember from my childhood on display. There are many items on display from many older boats that have long since been retired from use. One one light on display was off the... One light on display was off the Edmund Fitzgerald when it was in for repairs one winter. That's cool. Yeah. And if if you you don't know, and he mentions it here, uh, this is the same freighter made famous by Gordon Lightfoot. Mm -hmm. If you've never heard that song, go listen to it. It's one of my favorites. It's a good one. Um, When I was about to pay the entrance fee, a light behind the docent turned off and on. She looked surprised when this happened. During the whole visit, I had a heavy feeling in my chest like I was being watched. I couldn't stop thinking my father would have loved going through the museum with me. When my visit ended and left the building, the heaviness lifted. Was the light turning off and on a sign my father was there? I don't know, and I can't prove it. The entire day I was in Door County, it rained. A few storms rolled across the country, Um, having lived in this part of Wisconsin most of my life, I knew any rain clouds moving across Green Bay picked up moisture and intensified storms as they moved across the peninsula, uh, the peninsula that is Door County. Lake Michigan is on the other side of the peninsula. I've always liked to watch storms move across Lake Michigan, 
But on this visit, I couldn't help but think my father was with me visiting the museum. The day was enjoyable visiting the tourist spots with my wife, but I'll also remember feeling like there was another more spectral visitor there with me. I kept thinking I was going to turn around and say, love you, dad. Mm. Yeah. And you know that, that some of these are hard um, because I, I think when you experience strong memories of a loved one that's passed, you can get those feelings. Mm-hmm. Now, those feelings don't necessarily turn lights on and off. Right. Okay. Right. Um, but I, I think in some manner you can, you can call your spirit can call out to theirs. Yeah. They're on your mind. You're, you're thinking about them. There's a lot of emotion behind those thoughts. And maybe that's enough to, to reach across and say, Hey dad, I'm thinking about you. And you, you get an answer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. All right. Our next story comes from Jr. It says, this story comes from when my wife and I stayed at the Omni Parker Hotel in Boston. It says, this was just an average getaway to Boston to sightsee and make a side trip to Salem. I did not remember the room number or the floor we were on, but the room layout is important. When you enter the room, the bathroom is to your right, and immediately after it is another small room like a walk-in closet. Long and narrow with a shelf with an iron with an iron resting on it. The rest of the room opens up with the bed and TV, etc. We were asleep one night and my wife nudged me awake to turn the AC off as it was too cold. I enjoy a cold room, but I agreed with her about it being too cold. I begrudgingly got up to turn off the AC. I passed the thermometer by the bed. It read 68 degrees. I walked to the AC unit below the window to adjust the temp, and as I did so, finger out, ready to turn it off, the unit stopped. Huh, I said. My wife asked if everything was okay, and I said yes. The reading on the unit was 64 degrees. I thought it was odd to have two different readings in such a small room, but I climbed back in bed, and I didn't think too much more about it. About five minutes later, the room still freezing, we heard shuffling. Yep shuffling the sound of feet being dragged along the carpet slowly back and forth in what i can only assume was the narrow room next to the bathroom my wife reached back and grabbed me as she heard it too we listened for a while and i'm not sure how but we eventually drifted off to sleep yeah that omni parker's got a lot going on oh yeah we've talked about that place yep that's kind of cool though but yeah i the temperature difference might not be anything only because, you know, it could have old thermostats and it, it, the reading could be off, but there's no mistake in the, the shuffling sound. Right. You know, yeah. unless you had like a raccoon or something in there, which I think you would have known you had a raccoon in your <laughs> Omni Parker right. extra room there. And and, he, and it would have been wearing shoes too. So right, it would have had a bit, yeah, and had big feet. So it'd have been a weird looking raccoon. But yeah, you know, you ever seen a raccoon wear shoes? It's weird, man. It'll freak you out. It really is. It really is. <laughs> Jim up the street has a, a raccoon that wears shoes. It's weird. It's totally weird. Walks on its hind legs. It's mm-hmm. Totally bizarre. I can catch it riding a bike down the street. So. <laughs> now that I think about it, that actually might be his kid. And now I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, (laughs) moving right along. Uh, This story comes from JB, and JB writes, My father passed away around six months ago, and a day or two after the funeral, my older sister and I were sitting in my parents' kitchen talking while our mother rested in another room. Eventually, our topic of discussion got around to some of the creepy stuff we experienced growing up. Knocks, things moving, creepy shadows, etc. In the middle of this discussion, our mother came in and sat down. She then began to drop some bombshells on us. As it turns out, we didn't know half of what went on. Hmm. Our mother told us a story then. She met our father in the late 70s when she was 19, and he was a young 21-year-old lieutenant at Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood. Yeah. 
They had been dating for several months when my mother got invited to what she called a ghost party. Apparently, a few of her friends were into the paranormal and liked to do seances and mess around with Ouija boards. Yeah. According to mom, dad thought it was all a bunch of hooey, but he went anyway because he was hoping she'd come back to his place afterwards. Uh Well, they went to the party and ended up in a dark room lit only by candles on a table that they all sat around. My mother's friend Carla claimed to be a medium and began to instruct everyone to clasp hands, then started to call out to spirits of the dead asking them to come through to her through her and speak. After just a few moments, however, Carla faltered and began to look a little queasy. She stated that something didn't feel right, and as she did, my father's head fell forward. Hmm. My mother then goes on to tell us that several different distinct voices began to issue from my father's lips. These voices were speaking some harsh, guttural, yet somehow sibilant language that nobody at the table understood. That's crazy. My father's head then began to rise back up. And as it did, these voices began to get louder halfway up his eyelids open and nothing showed, but the whites of his eyes. When his head got back to its normal position, the voices stopped. And in the dim light, his face looked almost skeletal. And he had a leering smile on his face as he seemed to stare right at Carla. Mm-hmm. Carla then jumped out of her seat with a cry, grabbing at her face. In the instant that followed, everyone else around the table also jumped up, and they all looked over at my father, who sat there blinking his eyes and looking confused. Looking back at Carla, who was now crying, they saw a red handprint begin to appear on, in her, on her face as if someone had slapped her. Oh, wow. After that evening, my parents never went to another ghost party. I don't blame them. Nope. Obviously, my parents did eventually get married, and my father continued with his military career. However, things began to happen around him that couldn't be explained. In every apartment and eventually houses that they lived in, strange stuff would begin to occur after a few months of living there. It usually began with small things like knocking or footsteps, and whispers heard from nowhere. Eventually, it began to escalate into small objects moving or disappearing and reappearing in other places. Then larger objects would move on their own. These were my sister and I's experiences as well. What we didn't know is that there was a whole other level of things going on to my father. The longer we stayed in one location, the more he became affected. He began suffering from sleep paralysis. He would wake in the middle of the night and see anywhere from three to sometimes six or seven inky black humanoid shapes around the edge of the bed. These figures had no discernible features and were of varying sizes and shapes. There was only one constant, a tall, thin man shape with only one feature my dad could see, a leering evil smile with too many teeth. Mm. My dad's only relief was that we moved around constantly thanks to his career. I never really knew anything was going on with him. Although there were clues, for me it culminated when I was 18 and about to leave for college. My sister was already gone and was starting her family, and my dad was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana. We had been in that particular house for around three, maybe four years, and had just had my aunt and two young cousins over for a week. Well, one night I woke up in the early hours of the morning to the sound of small children playing and running on the first floor below me. So half asleep, I went downstairs to see what my cousins were doing up that early. I was about halfway down the stairs when my sleep addled brain realized that my aunt had left with my cousins two days prior. Oh, geez. I was still hearing the noises when I rushed down the rest of the stairs to see just what the heck was going on. I was shocked when I got to the bottom of the stairs, turned into the hall leading to the den. My father stood silhouetted in the doorway of that room. I stopped in my tracks and quietly called out to him. The noises stopped abruptly and he turned to face me. 
but did so in such a rigid post- posture that it seemed as if he was on the parade ground and I had said, about face. His eyes were sunken in shadows and his face seemed drawn and skeletal. He peered back at me with a sort of dead look and said nothing. So I repeated myself warily, like, dad? <laughs> his face seemed to shift back to normal and he shook himself and then blinked at me for a moment before saying in a weary tone, yeah, son. When I asked him what was going on, it took him a second or two before he said, what? Oh, nothing. I've got it handled, bud. You just go back to bed, okay? I began to protest and ask him about the noises, but he cut me off. Everything will be okay. Now just go back to bed, please, and be quiet so you don't wake your mother. I complied, and he turned back to the den. As I got to the landing at the top of the stairs, a shiver ran up my spine and I glanced back down the stairs and saw him standing at the bottom, that hollow dead look back in his eyes and his face drawn tight around the bones again. I hadn't heard him move, which was quite a feat in that old house with wood floors, especially given that my father was over six feet tall and probably weighed in at about 200 pounds. I shot into my room and shut the door behind me. Then I locked it, which I never did. And after a moment's thought, I dragged my dresser in front of the door. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. When I tried to question him about it the next day, he seemed to not know what I was talking about, and I let the matter drop. Shortly thereafter, I left and went off to college and never ended up moving back in with my parents. I have visited on many occasions for holidays, of course, and have stayed in fairly close contact with them. After over 35 years of service, my dad retired from the Army and began his next phase of life. He bought a rundown house and proceeded to fix it up. After about three years had gone by, he sold it and bought another fixer. Again, after a few years, he sold that one and on and on. They stayed in the Fayetteville area around Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which has been my dad's last post. My parents never lived in a house longer than three years, not once, until around six years ago when my father's back began to give him him serious trouble. After several surgeries, doctors told him that he simply couldn't keep doing the things he'd been doing for so long. So my parents bought the house my mother is still living in. Unbeknownst to my sister and me, my father began to slowly withdraw into himself for the last couple of years. He would always be the same when we would come for visits but my mom saw what was happening and was powerless to help. My father was a proud, stubborn man and wouldn't let anything affect her or his children. He always took everything on his shoulders. One morning six months ago, my mother woke up and found him lying beside her, cold and unresponsive. He had passed in his sleep from a massive heart attack. The strange thing was, he had never had any heart problems. According to mom, his cholesterol levels were good, He had great blood pressure readings. He never smoked and rarely drank. She swears that whatever it was that had attached itself to him back when they were young, these things or thing that had caused him to keep moving from place to place long after his military service had ended, these dark creatures that had plagued him his entire adult life, particularly the tall one with the evil smile and too many teeth, had finally gotten what it or they wanted. And the strangest thing of all is that a few months after he passed, I began to hear noises around my own house. In fact, as I sit here writing this, I can hear what sounds like movement in the room next to me. And though I have gotten up to check several times, the room is always empty. Maybe it's time to move. Jeez. That, I, that I'm, I'm not sure I have a good response to this I story don't. other than wow. Yep. That. It makes me sad a little bit um, to know that he dealt with that for so long. Yeah. And like many people do, uh, keep it to themselves and they deal with it personally Mm -hmm. and, you know, don't bring that on other people. And it, I, I just, I feel bad for him. I feel bad for his family. Um, it's an incredible, incredible tale. Yeah. And 
I thank you for sharing that with us because I know that can't be can't be easy. No, I, yeah, absolutely not. I mean, that's got to be just heart wrenching to to put this down. We appreciate you sharing. Um, it, it is it is an unbelievable story. Um, and yeah, I'm with you. I, I hate it. You know, for for his dad and for you know, it's and his mom. You know, I'm I'm sure his mom. You know, felt horrible that you know he had he had gone to that party mm-hmm. for her, but there's no way that anybody would have known or guessed no. you know that something like this could happen. And in fact, even even with these kind of stories, and I'm sure he knew this, you know, you were going to meet a lot more resistance than you were acceptance. Sure. Um, to a story like this, so sure. Um, so you keep it to yourself because you don't want people thinking bad of you or your family mm-hmm. um but and since you're hearing noises i i would say you need to get some help from yeah somebody in the paranormal realm that might be able to help you or a priest of some sort somebody um so that because it could be we've heard stories of lineages mm-hmm. being uh plagued by the same entity Mm -hmm. and so it could have gotten like your mom said gotten what it wanted from your father and now is moving on to you Mm -hmm. so i i would say before it gets bad maybe get some help or something absolutely yeah all right so the next one is from ar it says the first the first one happened around 2008 or 2009. I was 11 or 12 years old playing a soccer game right down the road from the Cardinal Stadium. At the time, I was the goalie and we were absolutely dominating the other team. So naturally, as a goalie, I was very bored and off in la-la land, staring off into the sky. All of a sudden, I noticed this white light hovering in the sky. I thought it was a helicopter at first or for some reason you know, something else. And I just stared at it. It then started to move back and forth horizontally. I thought that was strange, but nothing too crazy. Well, then it started to move up and down combined with a zigzagging motion as well. It was so weird to see. After a few seconds out of nowhere, it then just shot straight up into space. The speed was instantaneous. There was no color of an exhaust or noise. It was really strange. I'm inclined to believe it was an alien craft, and after that, I looked around and noticed nobody was looking at the sky like me, and they were all focused on the game. I told my dad after the game about this and recently asked him if he remembered me asking him that, and he said yes. So that that's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. That's that's a and I again, I wish I could see some UFO, but uh yeah says, I have a a ghost or spiritual story next. It says, this happened about a month ago. My wife was nine months pregnant with our first baby, and she was in a lot of physical and emotional pain. Right before bed, she tells me how she was praying for me lately. Now, I never pray, but I was very concerned for her, so I prayed for her as well. The next day, she was feeling better, and I headed off to work. I got to a job down the road, to service a diesel generator right next to an Indian reservation. I start by getting my tools out of my service truck and noticed I had a missing oil filter wrench. I looked everywhere for this thing and couldn't find it. I found a spare to use, but remembered I last used this filter wrench the afternoon before and was thinking, dang it, now I have to drive 30 minutes across town to get it if it's still there. A half hour goes by and I'm done and I'm cleaning up my tools, putting away hoses, etc. And I look down and this missing filter wrench is right there on the fender of this generator. There's no way I didn't see it that whole time I was working on there, nor did I put it there. In fact, I never even worked on this generator before, so I definitely didn't leave it from last time. I took five minutes to just stand there retracing my steps in my head about what just happened because it blew my mind that this wrench just appeared out of nowhere. And I don't know if it was God telling me something because I prayed the night before or what, or maybe it had to do with the reservation a few yards away. Anyways, it was cool and creepy at the same time. 
That is interesting. Yeah, I, it sure is. I I have had I've had things go missing and turn back up, and usually I make the joke that it's the Fay, mm-hmm. you know, in the house because that's a very trickster thing. But you know, it could have been since you were next to the reservation, depending on if it's the the tribes that have the legends of skinwalker or trickster spirits. I mean, most have a, like the coyote is the trickster spirit. Yeah. So it could have been a trickster spirit just messing with you because you were close to the reservation. Oh, yeah. Um, hey, Matt, did I ever tell you that reminds me of my missing banana story? No. Okay, so the house that we started recording this show in, the one that uh-huh. had Frank, the, uh-huh. the ghost, um, it was just me and Dallas there one morning. And if y'all remember, Dallas was my beagle basset mix. And I'm in the kitchen. I'm getting stuff to eat for breakfast. So I, I get a banana out. I lay it on the counter and I, I get like peanut butter and some stuff and I leave it there on the counter. Dallas follows me a lot at this time. He's younger, so he's moving more, you know, stop right. that in his old age. But he would follow me from room to room. So we left that room, went to the back of the house, back there where the recording room was, stayed there for a few minutes, came back. The banana was gone. I never found that banana again. So I don't know what happened, but I clearly set a banana on the counter next to the peanut butter and the spoon. Because I was going to eat peanut butter and banana. Mm-hmm. Everything was there except the banana. I looked everywhere. I I thought it's weird, but maybe the banana rolled off the counter somehow. What it it just disappeared. But so, had it, had it been peeled? No. Yeah. No. So you know, you know, Dallas didn't get it if it had right. rolled off because right. and he was with me the whole time. I mean, so. I I've got a dog that will eat just about anything, and they're not crazy about bananas and you know bananas aren't necessarily good for dogs anyway they certainly not going to eat one that's not peeled right and unless i had a weird house monkey i don't know what happened (laughs) yeah you remember that house monkey you had yeah you got that one that lived monkey yeah lived in the back bedroom (laughs) came out sometimes that's crazy Mm -hmm. but you know the same kind of stuff has happened to me in fact it's happened to well it, it somewhat happened to me. I, I lost something a couple of days ago. And the, the funny thing is, is as I get a little bit older, I, I will, I will put stuff down and I will, I will forget that I sat it down cause I was doing something else and I will go back and find it in odd places. Mm-hmm. Well, this particular thing I knew, I knew where I had it. And so I got up the yesterday morning and could not find it. Hunted, hunted. Amanda looked for it. Couldn't find it. So I, I left and went to work. And I had come back by the house for something. And I, I thought, man, I know that this is, I, I bet it's in my pocket. It's in my pants pocket. I was wearing different pants. Nope. I was like, well, maybe it was in my pocket and it dropped out. And I knew that wasn't right because I knew I had had it the night before and had put it on my nightstand. Hmm. Nope. Couldn't find it. When last yesterday evening, uh, Amanda said, well, let me go in here and look for it. Because I told her, I said, I'm going to have to replace it. Yeah. And uh, and so she goes, well, let me see if I can find it. She she looked for probably a good 20 minutes. And she's like, "I, I it's not in there. I cannot find it. You know, looked looked at all in the bed, under the bed, ever in the drawers for some reason. Nope. But now I have replaced it. I I guarantee you it will reappear. Sure. And it will yep. reappear somewhere it shouldn't be. Because I've yeah. had that happen so many times in the past that as soon I mean it may be missing for months. The minute I replace it. It will reappear and it mm-hmm. will reappear somewhere that it would never, I would never put it there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. And it is so strange, but it, it's happened to me so many times. I can't even count. Yeah. Yep. Weird stuff, man. Just, I know. just weird stuff. 
All right. This one this one's from a local boy. This is from yeah. A B. And A B says, I grew up in Middle Tennessee. Smyrna to be exact. And yes, we are familiar with that area. Yep. I lived in Laverne when yeah, I first moved right. to Tennessee. That's so. right. Just a, just one one town over, the neighboring mm-hmm. town. He says, when I was six, I moved into a new house in Smyrna with my mom, my stepdad, and my brother, who is about three and a half years older than me. As we grew up a little bit in that house and my brother started nearing his teenage years, he started become in, become interested in the occult. He had tarot cards, a Ouija board, and probably other things that I can't remember. His Ouija board was one that I believe he got from Spencer's, you know, the Spencer's gift oh, yeah. in the, gifts in the mall. He used to love Spencer's. Yeah. So it was just a store-bought plain Ouija board that you can buy that are pretty much marketed to kids as a game. Well, one day in the middle of the day when I was around 10 and my brother must have been 13 or 14, we decided to play with the Ouija board with some neighborhood friends. At this point, we would have lived in this specific house for about six years. We lived in the suburbs, so we had friends really close to us that would hang out with it all the time. If I remember correctly, we invited over two neighborhood friends to do this. We all decided we were going to go into my brother's room, hang a dark blanket over the window to make it pitch black in the room, and light a candle. We were ready to play with this board that we all thought was just some party trick game. We all sat down on the floor and began to play with this board. As we started playing, we would do the typical, are you moving it? And I always get the same response. No, I swear, I'm not. After a few minutes, we really zoned in and were asking questions, probably about the spirit's name and the typical Ouija board stuff. I don't remember the specific questions we were asking or any answers we were getting until we asked for a sign that the spirit was really in the room. When we asked that, the candle across the room and on top of my brother's dresser blew out. Now, even though we were on the floor and the candle was on top of a four foot tall dresser, I chalked that up to someone blowing it out. It freaked us all out, but that one had a reasonable, but that one had a reasonable explanation. And that's what I was sticking to for my own sanity. Mm -hmm. My brother lit the candle again and we continued asking questions to the board. I remember thinking the whole time, my brother is just moving this around because he always liked to mess with me and scare me. But the next thing that happened has stuck with me until this day, and I can't excuse this as wind or my brother just playing a trick. We started asking for the spirit to show us some kind of sign again. We weren't getting too many answers with other questions, so we were just wanting to see something real. The final time we asked for a sign, we look over to see the crucifix that my brother had wedged between the top door frame and the ceiling for six years fly off the wall. It didn't just drop. It came off the wall and flew a couple feet forward. At that point, we were done. We, Mm -hmm. We all ran screaming into the living room to see my mom's shocked face. We told her all about it, and I don't think she really believed it because to this day, she won't really say much about it. Or she believed it completely. That's right. At that point, we stopped playing immediately. We didn't properly close the board down or anything, which honestly makes me wonder if that's the reason for this very for the very difficult life my brother has had. We just stopped. To this day... That is the one single thing in my life that has shown me that you can't explain everything. I am very Mm -hmm. open to the idea that there are unexplained phenomena on this planet, but I am always a bit skeptical of it. As you should be. Yep. That day is one I always think about when I hear ghost stories, and I am thinking to myself, that can't be real. Mm. You know, and, and I understand. And I, I, I do. I completely understand. It's it's as if your brain is going, this just, it, I can't make sense of this. Right. You know, I don't understand it. It doesn't fit into what I, I think should fit. So 
it, it's just really, really difficult to accept that something like that is real. Yeah. I, and I, I have just learned to say, you don't have to accept that it's real or believe that it's not real. You just have to believe that it's possible that mm -hmm. we, we don't understand everything. Um, and that's good. I think it's good that humans don't understand. I think if yep. we understood everything, humans would just be fat, lazy slobs and we'd all look like job of the hut. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have something that, that drives you to learn and to, you know, develop your brain and, and your own opinion. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's just the way I feel. And so I never, I never get upset with people when, I, when they hear any of my stories saying, ah, uh, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm like, yeah. you know, you, you know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to believe it. It's, it's my story. It's what happened to me and I'm always willing to share it. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just one of those things. And, uh, and, and I, I, I think when you sit back and, and um, when uh, when AB sits back and says, God, did that all really happen? You know, it's just one of those things that sticks with him and says, there's there's something out there that you cannot explain. And yep. you've got you've got to believe that unbelievable things happen. That's right. Sometimes. That's right. All right. So this next one comes from RC says. All my life, I've seen spirits and entities, both good and bad. So it was kind of hard to figure out which story I wanted to share. I asked my friend which one she thought would be good, and this is the one she picked. Back in the 80s, we were living in a house that I grew up in, and this house was haunted and strange enough. This story is not about that spirit. The house we lived in was close to 100 years old and could not handle air conditioners without blowing fuses. So needless to say, being in the South with no AC, you are using fans and every window in the house is up. The house we had, the house had a front porch screened in with an old screen door. You know, the ones with a spring and when you open it, it squeaks and it mm -hmm. would stick at the bottom. Oh yeah. It says then you'd walk across the porch with wooden floors to the main door which was a glass storm door, and then you had a big wooden door that led into the house. One midsummer night, it was about one or two in the morning, and it's still really hot, so we have all the windows open and doors open, and my mom and I were in the living room talking, and all of a sudden, there was a knock on the glass storm door. We both were startled and looked at each other and looked at the door, and there was a woman standing there smiling and kind of half-waved. Now, neither of us had heard her come across the porch, nor did we hear the screen door open, and we always kept it locked. We went to the door and asked if we could help her. She says, yes, please. I just need to call someone. My car has broken down. So mom and I didn't think twice about it. We just opened the door and let her in, in to use the phone. She was saying her car was just up the street at the intersection and had broken down. Mama told her to stay with us until they got there, and that way she'd, she'd be safe. We offered her something to drink or eat. The poor girl looked frazzled and tired. We sat there talking with her for about a good 20 to 30 minutes, and she says, well, I guess I should be on my way. They should be there by now. My mom said, okay, honey, if you're sure, just take care and get home safe. And with that, she leaves. My mom turns to me and says, watch her to make sure she gets up the street okay. So I go across the porch and down the step and to the end of the yard to watch her, and she's gone. It could not have been more than 45 seconds to a minute tops since she had went out the screen door and down the steps and across the yard. The yard itself was not that big, and the street that we lived on was a straight street. There was no curves, no corners, and the intersection that she was supposed to have been stranded at was a good three-minute walk. She's nowhere to be found. And I hollered for my mom, and she comes out on the porch and said, what's wrong? I, I said, she's gone. Not a shadow, a peep, no sound whatsoever. The street was quiet. You would have heard somebody walking down the street. From where I was standing, 
You had a straight shot of about three blocks and there was nothing, no sign of her car. My mom looked at me and said, my grandfather always said to be kind to strangers and to help folks when you can. You never know when you would be entertaining angels. And I, I've heard of stories like that of, uh, you know, you get the, the traveler and it's not really a, a traveler in distress. It's, you know, an angel or, or something that is basically testing you to see your, you know, if you're a good person or not. And I, I think there's even fables about it from way back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's another one of those things that it's just, it's really difficult to try to explain those things away. When they first started telling the story, I thought it was going to be like a black eyed kid situation, you know, where it was a, a meant to do you harm kind of entity that needed to come in, not a something like that. But I, I like that story. Yeah. That, that is a, that's a cool story. Yeah. All right, so our next story comes from J.U., and uh, Jay says, uh, he says, he just tells us, hey, guys, my name is He said, I'm 22 and from Kansas. My first experience with the paranormal occurred at my grandma's house when I was eight years old. I was staying there with my cousins and aunt. My uncle also lived there, so in total, there were six of us. My grandma's house is a classic ranch style, so it's laid out where you walk in the front door to the living room and basement stairs, and behind that is the kitchen and dining room and a hall to the bathroom and three bedrooms to the right. That night, I was sleeping on the couch in the living room and my cousins and aunt in the guest room, my uncle in his room at the end of the hall, and my grandma in her room. They all turn in really early, around 7 or 8 p.m., and I never had set bedtime and I never had a set bedtime, so I stayed up late watching TV on the few channels my grandma had. So as I'm settling into the couch to finally go to bed with my back against the wall, because I never liked having my back turned to open spaces. You sound like Adam. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, he said I was about to turn off the lamp on the side table next to the couch when I noticed my uncle coming out of his room and coming down the hallway. I figured he was going to the kitchen or the bathroom or something, but I realized he's just standing at the end of the hallway. So I sat up and said something along the lines of, hey, uncle, whatever, um, but got no answer. I started to get scared because I realized that that wasn't my uncle, but just a black mass standing at the end of the dark hallway and that it, it looked like it would get closer, but never actually moved. I only really thought it was my uncle at first because it looked like it had a smooth, bald head like his. I didn't know what to do. It's not that I couldn't scream or move, but it just felt like I shouldn't. But I was so afraid, I didn't didn't break eye contact with it um, for what felt like forever. Then I started to think that maybe it wasn't here to do anything to me since it hadn't gotten any closer. With it still watching me, I decided to lay down, still facing it, so I could keep an eye on it and make sure it wouldn't move. I eventually passed out and woke up to my cousins leaving. It was already late in the morning, and my grandma said that I wouldn't wake up, so she just let me sleep in. I didn't tell her about what happened, but I told my mom when I got home. She told me that her dad passed away when she was younger. She would see a similar thing standing either at the end of her bed or my aunts. So she always thought it was their dad keeping an eye on them at the, and at the time that made me feel better. It was a while before I saw something similar. My brother and sister had seen things in between my next encounter. My sister would see people running through our yard at night, even though we had a six foot tall fence and lived in the country. And when we moved into a converted garage in the middle of the woods, while we were building our new house, My brother claimed he saw people in the woods watching the house. That's weird. But I can, I can substantiate those stories. I can't substantiate those stories because I never saw anything like that. 
When we did get into our new house, it was a dream come true. While while we were still we still all had to share a bathroom, we all got our own rooms and a greater sense of freedom. I was now 13 and got my room in the attic across from my sister and my brother, across from my sister and my brothers was on the main floor with my parents. Since my room technically wasn't in the floor plan, it had a pretty interesting shape with the roof lines and alcoves. So my brother was afraid to sleep alone downstairs sometimes because his room was across the house from our parents, and he was used to us sharing a room. So occasionally I'd wake up to find him sleeping on my futon or get woken up when he came into my room. But starting to be a rebellious teen, I didn't want my little brother in my room. So whenever he'd ask to sleep in my room, I'd tell him no. So one night he asked me to sleep in my room and I told him no. But sure enough, I woke up around 2 a.m. to find him standing by my futon. The window in my room didn't have any blinds, so I had a pretty good view of my futon from the moonlight. I sat up and told him to go back to his room, but I didn't get a response. I yelled at him again and still nothing. So I opened my dresser next to me and grabbed a roll of socks and threw it at him, and he didn't move at all. I thought it was really weird, so I turned on my lamp, and he was gone. Oh, geez. I got out of bed and walked around my room to see if he was playing a prank on me and even went downstairs to find him asleep with our dog. I went back upstairs to go to bed and slept with my lights on that night. I don't think it's what I saw at my grandma's because it was, it was the exact or very similar silhouette of my brother, hair and all, but it did have that same blacker than black coloring. Hmm. I, I have not seen a complete shadow person like that since, but I have through the corner of my eyes every now and then, uh, and, and every so often I get the intense feeling of anxiety that I'm being watched by an unseen presence. In my last story, I'll touch on my greatest regret regarding these experiences. It was my sophomore year of college, and I decided to take a class of ancient magic and witchcraft, figuring it would be an easy A and pretty interesting. In one of the lessons, we were asked to cast a spell using a sheet of paper and methods used by Greek witches. So since my roommates were pretty messy, I decided I'd cast spells to get them to clean the apartment. So using one of the methods, I called upon spirits to push my roommates to clean up the apartment, thinking it was all fun and games. Sure enough, the next day, I come home after class to a spotless apartment and am taken aback. But later that night, while I'm trying to fall asleep, I get woken up by three knocks on my bedroom door. So I go out to see if it was one of my roommates and no one was there. Same thing happened an hour later and an hour after that. So I was thoroughly freaked out the next morning and was, af- and was afraid I invited something into my life that I didn't want. So I found the piece of paper I used, went out to a park with my friend, burned it and prayed. The knocks never happened again, and I have not had any evident experiences since then. It's been two Hmm. years, so hopefully that keeps going. That's crazy. And again, that's one of those things that, you know, most people dismiss as just, you know, silly, not real, whatever. And you begin to dabble in it, Mm -hmm. and you understand why these you know, rituals or, or, or whatever, why they persist for hundreds of years. Right. Okay. Right. This is, you know, everybody, all Greek witches. Look, it doesn't matter. You know, a thousand years ago, they were doing something. And if it didn't work, they, they didn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of charlatans then. But there were also plenty of people that you read stories about who helped women get pregnant, you know, helped people find mates or fall in love or, yep. you know, become wealthy or cure some, you know, unknown illness. I mean, the, it just goes on and on for centuries. So you 
just like the Ouija board, you you just can't fool around with this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it it's it's fun. Look, I, Adam loves it. I love it. I love to read about this stuff. I love to learn about this, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, because you know of of my experiences, you know, in my life, I'm I'm not going to try any of this stuff because I'm worried about the same thing. Oh yeah. So oh yeah, exactly. All right. So the next one we got is from JP. It says I would like to start by saying that I was probably one of those creepy kids that I know y'all love so much. Sorry in advance. Oh, thanks, JP. Mm-hmm. All right, it says, now, some of the people in my family are a bit sensitive or gifted, you could say. Those stories are their own to tell, but I wanted to share a few experiences of my own childhood with y'all. It says, one example from when I was very young, perhaps four or five years old. My mother and I were standing in our laundry room, folding clothes, coming out of the dryer when my mother thought to herself, that maybe we ought to go for a walk in the neighborhood later since the weather was so nice out, to which I verbally responded, yes, I would like to go for a walk later. Creepy, right? Says, but plausible enough that my mom might have telegraphed her intention to go for a walk to me, like to me by looking out the window or out the door, and I just guessed what she was thinking. Well, the second instance I would like to share is much more difficult for me to explain that way. My birthday is September the 10th. Hey, mine's September 7th. There you go. So we're close. It says, and the year this incident occurred, it was still quite warm. So my mother, brother, and I were enjoying the afternoon of my birthday, hanging out in the backyard by our pool. Everything was going swimmingly, pardon the pun, until I looked up and became fixated on an airplane far above us in the sky. My mother and brother would tell you that I started freaking out and was virtually inconsolable about this plane. When they asked me what was wrong, I remember vividly trying to tell them about the bad men on the airplanes. What do you mean, bad men, they asked me. To which I I told them I wasn't certain, but surely there, there was bad people who wanted to harm us. I remember trying to explain who it could be. My 10-year-old self pulling from 90s action movies I'd seen with my family. China, Russia, my family continued to try to calm me down, but as I said, I was incredibly upset. The bad men, I kept telling them. How do we know that people who want to hurt us aren't on those airplanes? This went on for some time, with everyone growing increasingly agitated, until finally my mother got through to me by telling me, And I will never forget this. She said, by land, by sea, and by air, our military protect us. There isn't anyone that wants to harm us, and even if they did, they wouldn't be able to get us. By land, by sea, by air, we are protected. Which was a perfectly reasonable thing to say to your fourth grader that is having a near panic attack out of the blue about bad men on airplanes. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm sure you can see where this is going. The next day, September 11th, 2001, quote, bad men on airplanes attacked the United States in the worst terrorist attack perpetrated on our country in its history. I have no logical way of explaining my freak out on my birthday in 2001. I suppose you could say it was just a strange coincidence, but I was not a child prone to outburst or that had any particular fear of airplanes. This episode was fully out of character for me, which makes it all the stranger in my opinion. Since that day, I have not had any further episodes quite like this one. My mother would tell you that it was traumatic enough that I turned away from it and have eschewed any gifts that I might have, which I suppose is possible. I can tell you that I do tend to listen to my gut intuition, and it has very rarely led me astray. That's wild. It's very wild. I I love it, but that that is that is wild. Um, and I have to say, I I figured out what was happening uh, after the birthday comment, mm-hmm. and then you saw the airplane. I I figured out where it was going, but that that's just. I I mean, you you did have some kind of premonition, I think of. 
something bad that was about to happen. Yeah. You know, I've always wondered if, if this is similar to time slips where mm. maybe in mm. your altered consciousness of sleep in the dream state, you maybe jump ahead or, or jump back. Um, and, and maybe he, he jumped ahead, you know, 24 hours and, and witnessed in his, what would you would consider a dream witnessed the future, you know, in some capacity and, and they were awake at the pool though. So, well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They were hanging out at the pool and saw it. So I, maybe the night before yeah, he had dreamed that and it came back to him. Maybe he had seen something that way the night before. Yeah. yeah. And you know how you can dream and then forget about it and then something will trigger it later. Yep. Yep. And I see, I do that because I, I rarely remember a dream. Yeah. me. But then I will have, I will have a memory of something or something will trigger. And it, and I'm like, there's no way I know anything about this. And I think, well, I must have dreamed it. And yeah. the memory is still there. I just, I can't access it consciously until something mm-hmm. triggers it. I don't know. That's a crazy story. Yeah. Love it. Thanks for sharing. All right. So um, that was the last story for tonight, but it's not the last stories that we got. Um, we have, we have two listeners that they sent in their stories on time. Um, but we're going to do something a little different. Um, listener CF wrote us a poem. Um, it's really cool. Um, but it's, uh, it doesn't really fit in with the stories tonight. And our, our other story, uh, is sent in by SN and it is really, really long, but it's fantastic. Okay. So since these two were so unique, uh, we decided that instead of tagging it on to this and just kind of making it an extra thing, we're going to, we're going to give it its due. And these two, the poem by CF and the story from SN are, are going to be, we're going to put them out as a bonus episode. Um, so they'll come out on their own, just like we've done other bonus episodes in the past. Um, that, you know, we don't want anybody to, to feel slighted, um, just for the sake of time and continuity, Adam and I decided that this was the best way to present these two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so be on the lookout for that bonus episode and CF and SN, if you're listening, we got your stuff and we're, we're going to read it. Um, we're just going to give you your own time, uh, for everybody to hear it. Okay. But to everybody else, thank you so much uh, for the stories this year. I mean, we got fantastic stories. Oh, I yeah. mean this this is some of the this these are some of the best stories we've had in the years that we've done this. Um, you know, and and ranging from you know those heartfelt you know make you feel all warm and fuzzies to scare the living bejesus out of you. Um, and and that's what we love. We love it. We love that our listeners participate with this every year and just keep, you know, giving bigger and better stories and it 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 blows us away. So, um, you know, this has become our Christmas tradition and we're going to continue it um for as long as there's graveyard tales. Yep, exactly. But we we hope that you enjoyed um both of these episodes. I know Adam and I sure have enjoyed reading your stories and your personal experiences and whatnot. Um, and, and thank you so much for, you know, six years of graveyard tales and seven years, se- seven episodes of listener stories. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we, we sincerely appreciate it. Um, don't forget to, uh, to jump in on iTunes and rate and review us. Um, Coming up here on the new year, it will really boost the show. And as we've said before, the the way it works is when you leave a review, it it changes the algorithm slightly and it allows us 
to show up when people search for things like paranormal podcasts, ghost stories, scary shows, any of that, there's a better chance that Graveyard Tales is going to show up in those search results, and that just brings more folks into the graveyard. And, yep. and it makes Adam and I feel good. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, don't forget to go and check out our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com. And as always, you can buy uh, Graveyard Tales merchandise there. Uh, you can listen to the show and you can become a patron. And thank you guys so much for um, subscribing to our Patreon site. You get all that bonus content. Um, and, and we've got a, a huge, a huge announcement coming up for 2024 uh, for our Patreon members. So be on the lookout for that. If you haven't joined, um, now is a great time to jump in there. You've got a lot of lot of back episodes, and uh, you'll you'll be on the lookout for that big announcement for the next year. Um, I hope everyone has a safe 2024. And until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon.